Everyone knows ChatGPT, but do you know how it works? You perhaps know it predicts one word at a time, but do you know how it chooses the right word? Because it's probably not how you think. To change that, in this video, I'll walk you through some basics of ChatGPT, all the way up to how the custom GPTs work, so that you'll understand ChatGPT and pretty much all other LLMs better than 99% of people. Oh, and by the way, have a look at the video description, or stick around till this timestamp, because you'll get the chance to win an absolutely sick RTX 4080 Super GPU. Let's get started. Okay, what is the goal of ChatGPT? Well, the goal is to generate text that makes sense. How do we achieve that? Well, just like us humans, we write one word at a time. We write the cat chased the, and you have probably already filled in the blank with the word mouse. But how does the large language model, ChatGPT, understand these words? ChatGPT has to understand what has been written so far to have the context of the current conversation, but also an understanding of grammar and the general world to know what to write next. Let's first focus on the main mechanism of how the model can understand the words we or it have written. Again, a question for you. How do you read? Well, you obviously read one word at a time, but somehow remember what the main information was that you have just read. Not only that, you also pay more attention to some words that were more important than others. And you somehow build connections between certain words that are important to each other for the overall understanding. This is what the famous attention mechanism does. It figures out which words are important to each other to understand what is actually happening in the sentence, instead of just looking at each word separately. So ChatGPT does something very similar to us, except it does not read one word at a time, but it looks at all words at the same time. Looking back to our example from before, the cat chased the mouse, ChatGPT will now use attention to recognize that, for example, cat and chased are related, and that mouse and chased are related. If ChatGPT now wants to complete the next sentence, the mouse ran away from the, it will use attention to recognize that mouse and ran are related and that from and cat are related. So it will know that the next word needs to be cat. Okay, that makes sense. We now know how ChatGPT can understand what is happening in the current text or conversation. But what if ChatGPT wants to complete the sentence roses are Dot, dot, dot. Well, it can obviously do that, but it can't guess the color based on the text it has currently read. It can look only at the words roses and are. That is why I mentioned the model has to have some general knowledge of the world. All that world knowledge is somehow saved in the neural network, the physical brain of ChatGPT, and it learns that during the training by reading a lot of text. And by a lot of text, I really mean a lot. Much more than all of us combined could even read in our entire lifetime, I guess. GPT-3, a previous, a bit simpler version of ChatGPT, was trained on an equivalent of about, wait for it, 90 million novels, and it was trained for an equivalent of about 355 years. This stage is called pre-training and teaches the model all the fundamental understanding of language, grammar, and a bit of world knowledge. That is why GPT is called GPT. It stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Generative because it generates text. Pre-trained, well, because of this pre-training on humongous amounts of data. And Transformer because that is the name of the neural network architecture that uses this attention mechanism. But the sheer amount of data it was trained on aside, how did it actually learn from all this data? Well, there are two main ways such a model is taught to understand text, how it is trained. And they are both actually pretty simple. The first method is called masked language modeling. And what this pretty much means is that we literally take a sentence like the cat chased the mouse and hide one or more words. This is then also called masking the word and is why this procedure is called masked language modeling. The LLM now simply needs to predict the word that was hidden. In this case, our LLM needs to predict cat. This way, the model learns to understand the relationship between words and also learns some general knowledge about the world. For example, that cats usually chase mice. The second way to teach an LLM how to read, understand the world and also write is the simple next token prediction task. You might sometimes hear the term token, which you can for now just think of as a different way of calling words. So we can call this task next word prediction. And the name quite literally describes what ChatGPT is taught to do. We start a sentence with the word the and want it to predict the word cat. Then given the words the and cat, we want our early 
ChatGPT to predict the word chased and so on. Pretty straightforward idea, right? Okay, cool. We now know how we are teaching our little AI to understand grammar and learn things about the world, such as the fact that cats chase mice, at least most of them. But how does little ChatGPT speak or rather write? How does it actually pick the right word? Does it also write like us one letter after the other? I can straight up tell you that LLMs like ChatGPT don't predict one letter after the other. They predict one word after the other. Which again is not 100% true, but it is true enough for this video. But then how does it know which words exist? There are 26 letters in the English alphabet that we as humans pick from to write. Chinese would be a whole different thing, but there are like several thousand of words in the English language, so ChatGPT would need to pick words from all those, right? Yep, that is pretty much what it is doing. It reads the given text as already discussed, understands what it means, and then assigns to every every single word in the English language a probability. Not to speak of the fact that ChatGPT can actually speak multiple languages, so it has to pick from all the words from those different languages as well. Now it could simply pick the word with the highest probability, which is actually not what happens. That would be too boring and ChatGPT would then always predict very similar things, but since we have a probability distribution, we can sample words from that distribution. It's like rolling a dice, but not all numbers are equally likely. Some numbers, or rather words, are more likely than others. To make it even more interesting, there's another knob that we can tune called the temperature. You can think of this knob as the craziness or creativity parameter. The lower the parameter, the more equal each word probability becomes. The model can get more creative, which in the limit means at at some point, we're just picking a random word. All numbers on the dice are equally likely. The higher the temperature, the more extreme the distribution becomes. More likely words become even more likely, and less likely ones become even more unlikely. Again, in the limit, it effectively is the same as always picking the most likely word. All sides of the dice contain only one word, so no matter how often we throw the dice, we always get the same word. Pretty cool, huh? Now, is our LLM finally ready to chat with us like ChatGPT? Nope, it still isn't. Currently, it is an absolute soulless beast that just tries to copy the mess it was trained on, the entire internet. That is where the next step comes into play. You see, this pre-training optimizes for completion. So if you give a pre-trained LLM, say, how to make pasta, any type of completion is valid. For example, adding more context, like how to make pasta for broke college students, or adding a follow-up question, such as how to make pasta, what ingredients do I need, or actually giving an answer just as you probably wanted. The goal of supervised fine-tuning is to teach the pre-trained model to generate the response that you are actually looking for. And how do we do that? Well, well, we already know that the model is good at copying what it has seen already. Again, up until now, all the mess from the internet. So we now just give it examples of responses that we actually want to see. This can mean different things. For example, we might want to fine-tune our model for summarization, or translating to another language, or question answering. In any case, the examples we show our model always come as prompt and response pairs. For example, question and answer pairs, or text in English and text in German pairs for translation. Supervised fine-tuning teaches the beast to clone a certain behavior and not to rampage around with whatever it wants to complete the prompt with. I don't want to be remembered that I'm a broke college student, okay? But nevertheless, our LLM is now pretty decent. That said, given a prompt, there are many acceptable responses, but some are still better than others. Our demonstration data tells the model that we, for example, want answers when given a question, but doesn't tell the model how good or bad a response is. There's now one final step to creating a model that we think gives good answers and sounds like a human. Okay. Think of this. What if you can somehow automatically rate how good the response of our model is when given a prompt? For example, rating how good the answer to a question is. Then we can use this scoring function to continue to train our LLM towards giving responses with higher scores or rewards. It's like letting the LLM play a game of getting a better and better high score. That is exactly what RLHF does, reinforcement learning from human feedback. It uses such a scoring function to rate the LLM's response 
which we can use to train the LLM to get a better and better response. But to do that, we first need this scoring function, which is officially called the reward model. And how do we get such a model? It's actually quite simple again. We can, for example, just train a new model to pick between two responses and tell us which is the better one, given a prompt. The more difficult part is to actually get trustworthy data. Actual people here have to go through these examples and pick what they think is the better response. That is where the human feedback comes from in the name RLHF. There are some challenges with this, but this is for example how OpenAI asks their labelers to rank four responses, which also generates pairs of better and worse responses. Because if response A is better than response B and response B is better than C, then A is also better than C. So okay, we now know what the reward model is and how we get one, but how do we actually use it? Well, we use our reward model for reinforcement learning. We now simply start off with a new prompt. For example, again, a new question. Our LM now generates new answers and we can now use our trained reward model to give a rating, again, also called reward. Using this reward, we can then adjust our LM. If the rating was good, we want our LM to more often give such responses. If it was bad, we want it next time to give a different response. We now repeat this for as long as we want until we are satisfied with the new RLHF fine-tuned model. So in the end, we can train the LLM to give responses that we humans prefer. Better answers to questions, better summarizations, better translations, or also responses that are more aligned with our political views or amount of cussing we tolerate. This rating is often, of course, very subjective, but that's why this step especially can be seen as giving the model some kind of personality or making it more friendly, at least to some people. For others, perhaps not so much. Okay, that was a lot of work to get an LLM to understand language, understand what type of responses we want given a certain prompt, and what style of response we subjectively prefer. And you want to tell me that we have to repeat all this every time we want to do even the tiniest update to our model, each time you want to adapt it to a specific use case? Luckily, for many use cases you don't need to do that, because of one technique called retrieval augmentation generation. Let's just say I want to have a chatbot that you guys could ask anything about me. For example, when my birthday is, where I was born, my top 10 anime, or or I don't know, my zodiac sign. I don't want to retrain the entire model. That's completely overkill and things might change, like my top 10 anime. And then I would need to retrain the model again. How about we think of the simplest idea of how to solve this problem? Okay, I mean, I could literally just tell the LLM all this information. I would add it to the conversation, but just not show that part of the context to the user you guys. This is a reasonable static solution of designing such a custom version of an LLM. But what if we have a more complex scenario? What if we are an online store with hundreds of items and a customer wants to ask a question about a specific product? Well, we can't just add the information for all items to the chat window. That would be way too much for the LLM to handle. But what if we had a system that could somehow intelligently retrieve the information of the product in question and add all only that to the context of the conversation. Well, that is exactly what retrieval augmentation generation does. I also think the name is kinda awful, but it retrieves relevant information based on a query and augments the generation of the LLM by adding the retrieved information to the context window. This information can be stored in some database and be very easily updated so that, for example, you can always have the up-to-date number of available products so that the chatbot is always up-to-date. But we can also add information that we have retrieved from the internet, not only our own database. This is for example what you can see when asking Microsoft Copilot anything. You can always in the bottom see what sources it used to update its knowledge for the response it gives you. RAG is one of the most useful techniques to make use of LLMs for many different tasks without expensive retraining. If you want to learn more about how RAG works and how it is used in industry, I can highly recommend to sign up to NVIDIA's virtual or even in person GTC event and look at their free talk on RAG. GTC offers so much amazing insight into the world of AI, it's genuinely inspiring. Some more talks that I'm looking forward to are the talk on live speech-to-speech -speech translation, autonomous drones, and LLMs for diverse languages. The best thing is, the virtual event is not only free, but I've even partnered with Nvidia to give you the chance to win an absolutely amazing RTX 4080 Super GPU. And if you want to go one step further, Nvidia offers amazing paid workshops 
workshops, such as one on fundamentals of deep learning, one where you actually build a transformer-based NLP application, or even an actual diffusion model for generating images. You have literally nothing to lose. The event alone is worth it, but now you also get the chance to win an RTX 4080 Super. All you need to do is follow the instructions in the description. But okay, now that we have understood all this, we know everything we need to understand the new custom GPTs. It's just a cleaner and more user-friendly way of adding all the custom knowledge to the custom GPT. You can add static instructions, for example, the address of the store and how to greet customers. Cool. But you can also upload documents, for example, a list of all products available in the store and their information that are then automatically broken down. Those documents are then available to the custom GPT to retrieve using the just described rag system. You can also add instructions on how to access certain custom APIs by more or less just showing the custom GPT how to use them. There's absolutely no model training for any of this. I personally think all of this is really exciting to learn and there has never been a better time to do so. But all this was still just a high level understand. So if this video inspired you to really learn machine learning, then this video right here will show you how I would learn machine learning if I could start over. Bye bye.